with that, I'm going to turn the time over to Lincoln Fillmore tonight, and he's going to present the Mendenhall Method I'm okay, it's Mendenhall, on how to evaluate your director. Thanks. Hi. So I'll, I'll introduce you guys in just a second. I have a slide here about that. But it's good to see all of you. I see some Thomas Edison people, and some leadership learning people, and Bear River people, right? Mm -hmm. And who else is here? Anybody besides from those three? Yes. Intent, great, nice to see you. Okay, so uh, as Joy Lynn said, my name is Lincoln Fillmore, and uh, I've been in education since 2000 when I started as a teacher. I taught fourth grade. It was a great joy of my life. Um, I uh, also served as a principal and a charter school business manager. I've been on three different charter school boards. I've written all or part of about a dozen charters in Utah. I've served on the board of the Utah Association of Public Charter Schools and two other education nonprofits. Um, and it is my great pleasure to be here to try to help your board develop. It's one of my great philosophies that good governance costs less than bad governance. And so you, I commend you for being here and investing some of your time and resources into good governance. Uh, and uh, just by way of safety information, the restrooms are out this door to the right and to the right. There's an unmarked door that I think was built at this campus like the room of requirement. So you have to like walk past it a couple of times thinking, I really have to go, I really have to go. And then you'll notice the door that opens by the suite. If you're nervous to go into an unmarked door, if you go through the double doors, then there's more traditional men's and women's restrooms just now that way. Um, so during today's presentation, which is going to be about how to build accountability in your charter school executive, or how to evaluate your director. Over the course of the night, I'll use the word executive and director or principal, and they all mean the same thing, right? Um, and some of you may have different titles for that position at your school, but I mean the executive, the one who reports to the board, uh, and if you have multiple campuses, then maybe you have multiple directors. But I'll also interchange pronouns, sometimes he, sometimes she. We've just got a wonderful mix of all those things in charter schools. And uh, uh, so I'll be using both pronouns. As we go over today, what we're going to do is talk about how to build um, an accountability and evaluation structure at your school for your school's executive. We'll talk about how that's going to be necessarily different from what you hopefully already have in place to evaluate all the other staff members of your school. But an executive's evaluation must be different. I'll talk about why that is. I'll talk about what you have to have in place from the standpoint of policies, how you could build structures and calendars, um, data that you can use, what data not to get distracted by, some stuff that doesn't matter. And I hope to be able to provide you some really good, practical, usable knowledge that you can take away from okay, I know how we can get started on doing this, or how we can tweak what we've already got in place, or give you confidence that what you're already doing is so awesome. So any one of those would be very good. Um, I think I'm familiar with most of your schools, but just by way of this, how many of you are board members at your school? A bit of the majority. And how many of you are the executive? The, or, or a principal, two of you. Okay, you're brave for coming, but I'm glad you came. Uh, and so, um, I actually keep an eye. So, Thomas said, so you guys been open for like ten years? We're in our fourteenth year. Fourteenth year. Apologize. And you, leadership learning, you're in your second year. And Bear River five. Congratulations. And you're in ten. Okay. So we've got a nice wide mix of veterans and middles and newbies. That's great. And then how many of you here, I expect that are board members, how many of you have a job where you get evaluated? Yes? And are any of you executives at the job where you get evaluated? Okay, fine enough. That just helps me know the audience just a tiny bit. I want to start by just making some blanket statements that I'm just going to accept as truth, right? These are the principles that I'm just going to insist that we agree on, although if you have an argument with me, we we'll can engage in that for just a minute. But I hope that nothing that's on the board here is going to be controversial. This is uh, kind of the foundation on which we need to build. And that is that 
all employees should be evaluated every year. And so I own a company, I have like 15 people who work for me, and uh, it sometimes is hard to get to those kinds of things. And those of you that are school principals or if you're ever in charge, you know, evaluating an employee is not necessarily the fire that's burning all the time, right? But if it doesn't happen, then employees tend to get uh, demotivated, they don't get the feedback they need to improve. So we'll just say that every employee ought to be evaluated every year, and that those evaluations ought to be based on criteria that everybody knows in advance, right? If I'm an employee, I should know what I'm going to be measured on so that I know what kinds of things I can achieve in order to get a positive evaluation. And that that criteria should be easily measurable, right? That it's, it can't just be somebody's whim, but it ought to be something that you can actually look at and that everybody can look at the same set of information and agree that this information means something and that that has a universal meaning to everybody and that that criteria needs to be consistent with your school's mission. That if you're a whole child, the child project school versus the direct instruction school, that those are going to be different data points, and that's fine. Make sure that as a board that you're picking criteria that are relevant to your mission, and not necessarily relevant to the state charter school board. Does that make sense? Not that I'm telling you to ignore your authorizer, but I just want you to make sure that you are focusing on your mission and that your evaluations help to further the accomplishments of your mission by making sure that the data that you collect is good with that. Can everybody see this board, or do we need to turn some lights down? I see thumbs up and nods. Great. OK. So uh, here's a question. I'm, I hope that you guys will participate. I did this uh, presentation a couple weeks ago in West Valley City. Those Salt Lake people, too urban. They are just scared to participate. <laughs> We've got kind of a smaller, more rural group today. That's awesome. You guys are friendly. I'm going to ask questions, and I'm going to do the teacher thing where you ask a question, and you get the nice seven-second uncomfortable pause to make so that everybody can get over their anxiety about speaking up. So this is a good question for both directors or board members. Uh, how should the school director evaluate teachers in the performance of their job? And keep those four principles in mind that were on that previous slide. How should the director go about doing that? Yes, sir. Evaluate learning outcomes, progress okay. on learning outcomes. Good. So you're look, you're pointing to something that's very good that is measurable, right? That there's some outcome that everybody can see at the end that knows here's some, you know, we've done some assessment that the students have achieved at this level. Very good. So it's going to be based on the outcomes of what they get inside their classroom. What other aspects would you find to a good teacher evaluation? It really needs to be observable. Good. Yeah, so the, the data needs to be accessible to everybody. So you, as a good director, you probably get inside your teacher's classrooms and you watch them, right? And then the other part of that is that the, the teachers need to know what is expected of them. That's exactly right, which gets to another one of those principles yeah. that we yeah. have at the beginning, right? Uh, that before they go in, you know, they know that you're going to be looking for how engaged their students are probably, right? How well they know the content that they're teaching, how well prepared their lessons are. Um, all those are, are good things. Any other aspects you guys can think of? These, these two are directors here. They get into the classrooms even more than I do. Okay. That's what they do. So Great. They know all of this too. They know, they know what they're doing. <laughs> good. So what data will you get? So, uh, observing in a classroom is a way to gather data, right? That you might have a little form that you fill out, right? That, that, you know, how engaged the students are. And you can say, you know, we probably rank them one to five or something like that, right? And uh, write down how everybody's doing. And you also gather outcome data. There's some assessment, whether it's Dibbles or the SAGE tests or whatever. And you gather those kinds of things. And the teacher knows in advance what they're going to be uh, held accountable for, right? And how does this compare, those of you who have jobs that are evaluated, how does that compare with how you're evaluated in your job? I'll tell a little story about mine. When I was got a job, I was out here, I was going to college, and I say out here. I'm wearing blue because I know I'm in true blue country. <laughs> uh, but I went to school at a different university, which where I would be wearing red. Uh, so I was working downtown, like at the ZCMI Center, the mall's not there anymore, but they, we had like a five-page customer service thing, right? Where you do a self-assessment. 
Do many of you do a self-assessment as part of your own evaluation, right? And your teachers probably do too, that's great. So it was really long and had to rank it one to five. And do I sincerely thank every customer? And I would rank myself on how that went. And do I count back change starting from here? And you know, say, okay, so that was 850, so here's 50 that makes nine, and one is 10, right? And I would rank myself on how well I did that. So it's very minute and detailed. And then I go in and talk to my supervisor, who would probably watch me a little bit. Like that. Is that similar to something that you guys do? So you guys do a self-assessment? We teachers? do, but, but we, we do it in a way where the, it's, it's very interactive. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not that they, they, they fill out the forms, although they can, they can fill it out ahead of time, but when they meet with us, we just go over it and we have a discussion about each one of those. Okay. And we ask them then to rank themselves, rate themselves. Good. Okay. So what we're talking about here are some principles that we've got in place that are going to be universal. We're also going to apply to how you ought to structure a, a, an evaluation program for your executive. But the specifics of those are going to be very different. Right? So you deviate from that when you're uh, evaluating your director. That is, the principles are the same. Known criteria, they have to be relevant, measurable, but the process has to be different for some very important reasons. And one of those is, I think the most important of those is, that your director is not, or ought not to be, held accountable to a five-page job description. Because while the director is accountable for everything that goes on in the school, he is not responsible to carry out everything that goes on in the school. Does that make sense? Your director is accountable for the performance of everyone under him or her. On that side, he has the authority to delegate tasks to anybody, right? So if your director is responsible for public relations and insurance and financing and enrollment and all of these things, it's way more than one person could do. So what's a mark of a good director or a good executive is someone who will hire a capable and quality team to help carry that out and then be held accountable for those results, right? But because of that, it's very difficult to have a five-page thing that says, oh, I count back my change to everybody, or I sincerely thank all of the parents, right? It's very possible that a good charter school executive has very little interaction with parents, right? And so to rate him on how well he communicates with parents might be totally irrelevant. From that standpoint, it's a very different process for how that Right? Uh, a good director might not be involved in teacher evaluations or teacher training at all, might not be involved in public relations or fundraising, or might. Um, if you're down, like Summit Academy, which is down in Draper, their chief executive is much more of a business guy, right? And he comes from the business world and he runs the business side of the school. And then they have the education piece that's held up, that's run by principals at each of their campuses. But the director uh, is responsible for each of their performance. But on the other hand, he hardly ever interacts with teachers, right? And so not all charter executives are going to be rated on how effectively they train teachers to do their job, but they all will be related on how well the teachers are trained. And does that distinction make a difference, make, make sense to you guys? Okay? So he can't delegate accountability because he is accountable for the performance of others. But from another standpoint, your director is usually not supervised on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And if he is, I'd say you have a problem with board governance, which we ought to address at some future time. But it should not be the practice that the board is in, you know, hey, today's the day we're going to come in with our clipboards and we're going to follow the director around and make sure that he's smiling when he interacts with the students and all that stuff, right? Because the director operates at a distance from those to whom he's held accountable. And so from that standpoint, there's not a lot of direct observation that can take place. And finally, the director ought to have a lot of autonomy in how he gets things done. Okay, so because of all of those differences, it's going to be much different. You're not going to have a multi-page job description, um, and we'll talk all, a lot more about how it ought to work. We've just talked about how it doesn't, right? So now I'm going to take these principles, and we're going to apply them. And again, I want you to know that I know that I'm in true blue country, not Provo blue country. Okay? So... Um, I was uh, putting this together, you know, in December, when this was more relevant. I should have come through it, and I could have called this the Carroll conundrum, and we could have evaluated <laughs> why Pete Carroll called a pass play, right, with 20 seconds left on the one-yard line. But this is so. This is a little bit dated, 
We're talking about Bronco Mendenhall here. So I don't know how many of you actually follow BYU football. It doesn't really matter. Um, so because you guys, if you don't follow it, at least that we're in Utah State country, so you'll know the main thing that happened to Bronco Mendenhall this year, right? So let's talk for a minute about how you evaluate this executive, right? So he's the executive of a football team, and in fact, he reports to a board. Funny enough, I'm giving this presentation, you know, two weeks ago in West Valley, and we come to this slide, and I'm like, how do you evaluate Bronco Mendenhall? You know, I assume that he's a coach, so he's the executive, and he probably reports to something like a board, and there's a sticker from out in the audience. It turns out that the chair of BYU's athletic committee is in the audience, in the front row, actually. She's on a charter school board. And so as we go through this, and I had a chance to talk to her after the game, after the, uh, after the presentation, she told me, she, I mean, I knew her. I just didn't know she had that one. Um, anyway, so she talked about, I, I learned a lot about this and how relevant this all is, right? So let's keep our principles in mind, right? So Bronco's the executive of his football, his charter football team, okay? And so he, therefore, if, he's, if this is done right, he is held accountable for outcomes that everybody knows about in advance, right? That the athletic committee has set some goals for him to achieve, right? And I don't know what those were. I got a little bit of insight after last time's presentation. But in doing this, I have, no, you know, I have no idea what they are. But you can imagine that you might focus on something like your win-loss record, right? Are you going to get to a bowl? Um, does your team win? Okay? Uh, do you get in fights after <laughs> football games? Okay? Did the, how well did Bronco Mendenhall do? So if we go in and we don't know what the goals were, I will say that I would project pr predict that he did not meet the goals of the athletic this year, right? So how many of you know enough about BYU's football season to know that they kind of underperformed when it came to expectations, right? And that the beginning of that underperformance occurred against Utah State, right? So just in case you don't know, BYU is 4-0 to start the season, and they had beat some, they beat Texas, right? I mean, who at the time was thought to be a pretty quality opponent. So they were doing really well, and they go down, and Utah State comes down, to, to Provo, and they hadn't lost to Utah State in Provo since like 1976 or something, right? So it was like, they're totally going to beat Utah State. Plus, Utah State's starting quarterback was injured, right? This wasn't even going to be a game. But Utah State plays pretty well, and that, you're, except you, I'm talking about Utah State fans, I assume, your, your backup quarterback was pretty good, and Utah State was playing really good that game. And then, what happens in this game is that their BYU star quarterback, who was a Heisman candidate at that point, suffers a really bad injury, right? That's the, knocked him out for the whole season. Later in the game, one of their top defensive players was out, and then a little bit later, one of their running back there. So a very costly game for BYU at this point, right? So that's something. It might explain why the team didn't perform as expected. But if any of you watched any BYU football, did you see what happened? after the Utah State game to BYU's football team? Did anybody follow that to the degree where they'd be comfortable talking about it at all? They started off 4-0. They lost to Utah State and then lost three more, to, which should have been like the patsy part of their schedule, right? They played like Middle Tennessee State, which who has ever even heard of Middle Tennessee State except their alumni, right? So, and... Uh, you could watch the team, and I was talking about this with the chair of their athletic committee afterwards, and you could just see that after the Utah State, actually after the injury, that there was just a completely different attitude that coming from the football team. You saw it in how they played against the rest of the game against Utah State, and then for the next three consecutive games. And they kind of recovered, and they went to a bowl, right? <coughs> so it's not all tears and injuries. They lost the bowl game, but it was really close, right? Uh, I think they lost by a touchdown in double overtime. So it was a nice competitive bowl game. On the other hand, if you watched any of that bowl game, you probably wondered a lot of times, just like you did Sunday at the Super Bowl, why would you call that play with 45 seconds to go in half, right? I don't know if you guys watched the football game. So there's a lot of data that is available to this board. 
right? Based on the win-loss record, they've got statistics on every player, they've got things that they can watch, just, you know, it's sports. So just the data, there's a ton of it. There's also data, like, there's a Fire Bronco Mendenhall Facebook page. And, you know, when BYU had lost four in a row, there were stories in the media about, look, Bronco's just not cutting it anymore, he's really got to go. So there's uh, stories in the media. What should the athletic committee focus on? when they're evaluating their football coach. Yes? The outcomes they gave them at the beginning of the season. True enough, right? And so, whether or not there was a fire at Bronco Mendenhall Facebook page, my guess is that's not one of the criteria, right? In fact, if you're a coach of a football team, you can pretty much guarantee that there's going to be a fire the coach Facebook page. In fact, if you operate a charter school, it's very likely that there will be a Your Charter School is Horrible Facebook page at some point of your existence. Have any of you had that happen to you so far? Oh, yes. Okay. We took care of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what happens, right? Because you're not all things to all people, and people are going to be upset, right? Everybody, everybody knows more than you do about your own job. They're not often shy to, to let you know about how that is. Okay, so when this, as I got to talk to the chair of the athletic committee, so this is a BYU, right? So in addition to having some football-based outcomes, they've also got like some non-football-based outcomes, right? And if you've ever heard Bronco Mendenhall give an interview, you know that he is a big proponent of quality people, right? Like he considers a part of his mission to make sure that the church that operates that school that, that, that he governs his football team in a way consistent with the principles that govern the church and that his players should behave in a way that reflects well on the church, right? So, if you know anything, there was a big, big fight at the end of their bowl game, right? And so, if any of you were watching, you saw on national TV that, like, this BYU player just ran up, and this is what they caught on TV, right? That he just runs up and, like, sucker punch somebody from the other team after the game. And so later there was more on that. We think I was already bloody by that time. But that does not reflect well, right? How many of you have a character component as part of your charter? Yes? I only see one nodding head back there. Thomas, that's what you guys have. I know you do, right? I read it on your website. Okay, so measuring character and the performance of students in multiple areas is a perfectly valid way to judge performance of the executive of these this group, right? But it's interesting, as I was talking to, uh, after last time's meeting, um, they were less concerned about the fight and more concerned about how many personal fouls got called on their foot on their players over the course of the season, right? And actually, there were a fair number, if you watch that. So this is just kind of illustrating this as an example that you need to apply those principles, right? That if you're a football coach, you need to know in advance what's expected of you. However, Bronco didn't make those. And part of the reason that he didn't meet those goals, I'm assuming, is because of events that were outside of his control, right? As a board, you're going to need to keep those kinds of things in mind, which is one reason why it's important to have an interactive evaluation process, right? Like you, Steve, earlier talked about what you do with your teachers, right? That you sit down and you talk. This is what we kind of expect. Classroom management is probably one thing you grade teachers on, but teachers don't really have control over lots of things that affect student behavior that happens outside the classroom, right? Um, but it's also important, we'll get to this in a bit, that bad news is not an excuse for bad performance. Does that make sense? And I'll illustrate this with an example that probably most of you know very well. Last year, the state of Utah changed from student assessment system that wasn't very good, A, to student assessment system that is not very good, B, right? <laughs> but the problem is that now, so when student data came out and all, you know, all of your schools received a grade, and I want you to know that that grade is completely meaningless to you, right? That, I, I mean, I don't know what you guys take in it, but when the state board, when it came out, that all the schools like dropped by 40% or something like that. So, what they decided to do is, instead of having all the schools get D's and F's, is they just retroactively adjusted the grading scale, right? And so what we're going to do is to just, we'll look at where, where all the, they scatter out 
And then we'll say this many schools are going to get A's, and this many are going to get Therefore, the standard for an A, which in law is like 80% or something like that, uh, we're going to bump it down to 65, right? That way, then we get a few schools are A's. So as a public and a school, that, that really tells us nothing about our performance, right? So as we, as schools, are being held accountable to our authorizer, what in the world are we accountable for from an outcome standpoint? Next to nothing, because the data is poor. Does that make sense? Like, they have no clue what any of the data means. It's important that as you guys go through this, that you guys know that that data management and reporting system is flawed, but that should not be an excuse for your principal to be able to say, hey, well, I don't know, you know, it's a new testing system, so now the grades are down here, right? Bad news, things that happen outside of your control is not an excuse for bad performance. We'll talk about that in a bit as we go over this. It would be pretty easy for Bronco to say, we ended up eight before because three of our best players were injured. And, well, that's all here and there. But the truth is, if you watch BYU play, you saw some examples where there was real weaknesses in the coaching staff because their team was completely unprepared to deal with injury to good players. And you saw that in how they played on the field. And you saw that in their attitude that they brought to the field. And I'm not really even that much of a football fan, but I could just tell by watching. I'd also like to point out that my wife and her sister and her mother all went to Utah State. <laughs> okay. So, um, from an accountability standpoint, this gets back into one reason why directors' evaluations are different than others that the school's performance equals the director's performance, right? They are, in fact, or ought to be, one and the same. Especially if you have a good, strong director who is who has autonomy and accountability for the performance of the team that he surrounds himself with, right? He ought to have the ability to hire and fire teachers, to hire and fire the people that help him, um, to interact with the media, and to choose people who do all of those jobs. And when he does, then he can be held accountable for the performance of the school as a whole. So the real judge of your director's effectiveness is how well is the school meeting the goals that we have set for the school. From that standpoint, the first thing I need you to take away, uh, besides the principles from how to structure this is, when you're setting director evaluation goals, you set them as school achievement goals, right? We expect our school to achieve this level of student achievement this level of enrollment, and this level of parent satisfaction, and this level of compliance with the law, this level of charter implementation, and this level of financial sustainability, or whatever your goals are, right? Um, it's important that you set those, and that once you set those goals, that your director's evaluation is basically these three things. This is your director's job description, right? Your director is accountable to achieve your goals within your budget, following all applicable rules. Does that make sense? I've seen nods. Is that controversial to anybody? Okay. By the way, this once we get through all rounds of this, we'll email this presentation out to you, and this will be posted online, um, this happy little lecture. So you can go on and, and rewatch it if you'd like to. Okay? Share it with your other board members. Like that right here. Okay? But since I see a few of you right here, hang out with this slide. Just to kind of sidestep for just a minute, 
The definition of board governance is essentially setting the goals to be achieved and setting the parameters by which your executive can achieve them, right? From that standpoint, you need to have policies that govern his behavior, right? There are some things that you're, there are some methods that your director can't use in order to do things. And a good silly example is spanking, right? Like, it's good, you, it's perfectly okay to say, director, you need to make sure that students are well behaved in class, and that's on you. But you may not allow the teachers to spank the kids in order to achieve that goal, right? So that if there is ever spanking at the school, then your director has violated his job description. Because even if he has met the goal of very good student behavior, he has violated the method by doing something that is in conflict with one of the rules that applies in that circumstance. Okay? So you need to have a book of policies. If you don't already have a policy manual for it, and this is pretty common for new schools if you don't have one, you should work to develop one. And the association has samples and things like that that are available in the state. That's a lot of templates. There will be resources that we talk about at the end of this. Okay, but those are the things you need to have in advance. If these aren't in place, then what you're going to do is be evaluating your director based on the completion of certain tasks instead of the achievement of goals. Okay, and that's going to be a problem. Uh, you shouldn't be evaluating your director on any interaction for several reasons, one of which goes back to what we talked about before. As a board, you just have such a limited way to observe those kind of daily things that your director does. And the, the ones that you hear about are going to be an unreliable sample, right? You, as a board, you're likely to hear complaints, but for the most part, you ought to ignore those complaints in evaluating him because they're not representative of what actually goes on. But I'll talk about an exception to that as we go, okay? Here are the things that you don't need. That again is kind of restating a little bit of what I talked about earlier. But you don't need, you will need, you probably do use all of these for your other employees at the school, but you do not need them for your director, right? And I'm not going to read everything that's up there, but certainly you want to base this on data and not your emotions or your feelings. And from that standpoint, I'd like to talk just briefly about a conflict that almost every board member has in Utah charter schools, and that is you're also the parent of somebody who attends the school. And as a board member, you cannot be evaluating your director based on the experience of your student, right? It needs to be based on criteria that's known in advance with measurable and reliable data that's set on an established timeline, okay? Um, a mistake that I see happen in a lot of the charter schools that I work with, and I consult with about 20 throughout the state, is that I see boards try to put in place systems that are similar to what they have at their own job or what the school already has for their teachers. And that's a mistake. The director's job is just too different from that. The responsibilities and accountability ought to be different. <coughs> so let's talk a little, uh, about data. Um, there actually is kind of a challenge in collecting good data about the school director. Part of that is because no board member is this director's immediate supervisor, right? You don't have the daily interactions that even when a school principal is not observing the same teacher every day, still, he's walking up and down the hallways, he sees the teacher's class walk up and down the hallways. As a principal, you have almost daily interaction with what goes on in almost every teacher's classroom, right? You're dealing with all kinds of things, reports, and injured students, and phone calls home, walks up and down the hallway, um, all of those things give the director a lot of data that he can put everything else in context. And as a board, you just don't have that regarding the school director. So you're also not really a supervisor, so you don't gather data. This is where you get the, your data from, right? And almost all of it is self-reported by the director. And I said that as a blanket statement, and I'd be happy if any of you corrected me about that. But for the most part, as a board, I'm going to just guess about this, and you raise your hand if you disagree or it's not true in your school. You're collecting data about the school, but most of that data is presented to you by the guy you're evaluating on the outcomes of that data, right? At your board meeting, it'll say, okay, we're going to get a report on our academic progress so far over the course of the year. And your director or somebody that reports to the director will stand up and say, this is how our students did on the Dibbles test, or this is how we did on SAGE, or this is how our parents survey went. Almost all of it is reported by the guy you're evaluating, okay? So we're going to talk about um, ways to manage that, to kind of remove the conflicts, things like that. Uh, 
You can also get third-party review. This you always do in your annual audit, right? That's a third party who's coming in and evaluating what goes on at your school and then giving a report directly to the board about what they found. But auditors aren't the only ones you can use. Lots of schools will use outside consultants who will come in, do focus groups and things like that, that uh, can help give the board kind of an outsider's perspective on how things are going. And then some schools, in fact, good ones, have some limited direct inspection by the board. And I'll talk about how that can work. But these are the three methods that you can collect data. And it's important to use all three methods. Um, but logistically, do any of you use self-reporting not as often as I had said earlier? Like most of the time, the data that you get as a board comes from your director. Isn't that right? OK, I see that. I have a question. Yes. Oh, and thank you. I should have said it. Please raise your hand any time for questions. So one of the things you didn't include there, so I, I um, am a professor at the university, and my dean is going through a evaluation. Uh -huh. And all of the faculty in the college, that he is our executive, essentially, uh -huh. right, um, got a received a form um, via email, website, thing, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't include in that any kind of... Uh, um, gathering data from the people who the executive is actually overseeing. Okay, I count that as a direct inspection by the board. So it's a really good question, and that's going to come up in a slide or two. But since you brought it up, I, I want to highlight another challenge, another mistake that I think most charter school boards make, and that is to outsource the survey of teachers and parents to the director instead of doing that survey on their own, right? that the, data, the results of that data can be very informative for the director, but primarily they exist to let the board know how the school is doing. So I always suggest that boards be the driving force behind the survey of parents and teachers so you can collect that data. So that's one of those things that I count as direct inspection. Okay? Is that controversial to anybody? If it is controversial, we'll talk about it. I'll give you some reasons why they're basically the okay? So I talked about it's important to get data from a variety of sources. So to your point, Professor, and I'm sorry, I don't remember your first name, but Harrison. Harrison. So you should get data from lots of places using all three methods, right? Outside parties who look at surveys of your parents and teachers, academic data, um, complaints, formal complaints that you guys receive as a board, which I'll talk about in just a bit. Right? And that data needs to cover all the aspects of the goals, plans, and budgets that are those ones that are known in advance and to which your director will be held accountable to. Right? That's not to say every policy, every goal, right? Uh, it's another mistake that I think a lot of charter school boards make is that they set so many goals that it's impossible to measure, right? If, if you have too many priorities, you have no priorities, right? So generally, I would recommend that as a board, you set between three to five goals that will be part of your director's evaluation every year that are outcome-based, and that you'll focus uh, the data that you collect on those things that you guys as a board have defined as most important. And then cover the other aspects of it in broad statements like following all of the laws, right? And uh, you know, having a general good impression and favorable reviews, okay? I do want you also to know that the director is part of those stakeholders, and so he should be part of the plethora of data that you collect. That there will be a lot of self-reported data, and in fact, it ought to be interactive. And you sh can and should talk to the director on a regular basis to find out what's going on, and if his quarterback gets injured, you should talk about what are the right, um, what are some reasonable responses for how that might work. Okay. Another thing, which is something that I find that very successful school boards regularly do is that at their monthly board meetings, that they will take a portion of their policy manual, maybe five to 10 policies, that they will review every month. Um, and this is important because director, I mean, trustees on a board of trustees tend to turn over fairly regularly, right? Um, it's not uncommon to have a board made up mostly of people who have been on the board for under three years, even though the policy manual might be five years old, right? So this is a very good way to just practice good governance by making sure that A, you know what the rules are that you're holding your director accountable to follow, and B, to make sure that the policies that were adopted at some time in the past are still relevant 
for how things work in the future. So I just recommend that as a best practice. That start at your board meetings, just reviewing a handful of policies, so that over the course of every year or two, everybody on the board has read your policy manually and checked it over. Okay? Okay, so uh, Harrison, I'm going to talk uh, for a little bit here about surveys. And I mentioned earlier that I think that boards ought to drive the survey process and not directors. Um, largely because they are the, uh, a very good indicator about parental and teacher satisfaction. And that you guys ought to have goals, right? You, you are, your enrollment is the lifeblood of your operation. Parent satisfaction is the lifeblood of enrollment, okay? So that is a key metric that charter school boards ought to focus on. I encourage you to survey your parents. And I encourage that survey to come from the board. Your climate of teachers is also very important because as charter school people, you know that the best uh, way to get good outcomes in classrooms is to have good teachers in them. And the good teachers won't stay in bad environments, right? Especially not in charter schools where, you know, we're at will employees and we can come and go and charter schools are growing so fast that it, it's easy to find greener pastures if you're looking for them and if you feel like my ear lawn is brown, right? So uh, it is important to do surveys. It's important for boards to do surveys, but it's important not to be over-reliant on surveys. I'm going to illustrate that with a specific example for how that worked. And this school made a couple of mistakes, the first of which is they uh, developed their own survey for the first time, okay? And the second mistake was that they let the director run it. So all the results went to the director before it came to the board. And so I think those are two big mistakes. But one of the outcomes of this was, by the, the time the survey got to the, to the board, it was quite late because the director had seen them. And this, uh, this was a, a staff survey. So it was surveying teachers and aides. And it was you know generated, so it was a lot like the survey that you have in front of you here, right? Where it's like rate one to five on these kinds of things. And then, of course, there's an open comment section. And it was done on SurveyMonkey. You guys know this tool, right? It's just online and you fill it out. So, of course, the staff goes in and, and creates surveys. Um, a third mistake that the school made is that they did not protect their data, right? So SurveyMonkey can be a fine tool, but the free version of SurveyMonkey is somewhat limited, and it can be a uh, doctor. Right? You wouldn't want to use that to hold binding elections because fraud is pretty easy. And so what happened is by the time the board collected this data, what they had is a survey data that showed that the school's assistant principal, who everybody knew was in line to become the director next year, because you know the, the lead director had been there for six or seven years, was retiring. The assistant had been brought on specifically, was being groomed to take over, and everybody knew this. But this survey showed that he was a womanizer and was rude and incompetent, okay? And like, the comments like, you know, when, when he talks to women, he looks at their chests, right? So this kind of thing. So the board is getting this like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. We've just put ourselves in the very worst situation, okay? But the problem with that is that that data was false, right? Uh, and so the problems that they had going in resulted in bad data coming out. You've heard that, right? Garbage in, garbage out tales, okay? So what this school should have done is use a reliable survey tool. Surveying people in an accurate way to get good, reliable data is actually a science, right? And it can't just be like, you know, a couple of people sitting in a room who haven't been trained in this sort of thing coming up with 50 questions to ask, right? Uh, and I recommend, in fact, the local university developed a wonderful tool that used to be called the Indicators of School Quality, and they changed its name to C4 or something like that. Do you remember the name of it, Joyland? It came out of our last meeting. It's C4. C4. Okay, so Utah State University, it's their college of, uh, their foundation for school excellence or something like that. They've got a very good tool. It's called C4. If you don't already have a good, reliable survey system, a good way to start is to buy this one. It costs $2 a student. The price is incredibly reasonable. They send it out, they collect all the data, they send that data to you, and by the time you get it as a board, you know that you've got, assuming that you had decent levels of participation amongst your, uh, your faculty <coughs> and your parents, that you've got a reliable set of data that will be actually informative to you about what the overall thing is of your school. That can be compared to 
real standards and how it works in schools across the country, right? Um, so what this board did, because they had that data, is they asked me to come down and dig into it a little bit more to see what I could find out. And so I went down, and we arranged for you know, 10 or so employees to gather together in a focus group. And um, in this room was the person that I thought had probably made those comments. And over the course of this focus group, which lasted about two hours, and I had some training there, so we kind of knew what kinds of questions to ask, but because I wanted to be able to see uh, if that person, when it's not anonymous, would state the same kinds of things, and if there would be any support. Does that make sense? Over the course of this meeting, it became very clear that, there was, that the results of this survey were skewed by one employee who wrote all of the written comments, right? and just wrote them in lots of different things. It shows up as like pages and pages, but it was really one person complaining, it's not a widespread issue, that this one teacher had had a, a bad experience, but it was just like she wanted something and the answer was no, and she held a grudge over this time. But that, the, but that the complete opposite of what the data showed was the truth, right? But the data was compromised. So it's important to use surveys, but it's important to be very careful in how you use surveys. And so as a way to do that, I always recommend that you use a reliable survey tool that's collected by an independent third party and it can be supported with further digging after you see the results, right? You might see results that say there's some things up here and there will probably be some things where you think, hmm, that's kind of a surprise to me, I wonder why that is. That it can be very useful for you to bring in somebody who can do a small focus group and try to dig into those kinds of things. And all of that is really inexpensive to have happen. The survey is inexpensive. A two-hour focus group is pretty inexpensive. Um, and the association will often pay for stuff like that because they got a grant to do it now. It's great. Um, be careful about surveys because if you do them wrong, they'll give you bad information, which will lead to bad decisions. Are there any questions about that? Or have any of you guys had bad experiences with surveys or good experiences with surveys that you'd like to share here for the benefit of the group? I thought you were raising your hand. I've got stories. All right. So let's talk about a little bit about verifying the data that you get, right? I mentioned one thing earlier is that the problem in collecting data because you're collecting almost all of the data that you use directly from the person who's being evaluated based on that data, right? So uh, in order to verify the data that you're getting, there are ways that you can do that. This is important to structure your school's overall operation so that you have these things built in. And I'll just talk briefly about those. You need to have segregation of duties within your organization. So that's obviously true of fund money and finances. But there ought to be a way by which people who report to the school director also have a way to get around the school director if that's necessary. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that I'm qualify, qualifying that, right? Because I don't want there to be a tattletale committee, right? And I don't want, uh, you know, your the people who report to your director to feel always empowered that every time they have a beef that they can just go around and talk directly to the board. That's bad. But there ought to be a formal way by which uh, people can disagree with statements of the director. Does that make sense? That if the director coming up, hey, things are going roses, look at our, at our trend, and it's going way up like that, you ought to be able to have that verifiable by other folks at the school, right? Uh, so that's why I talk about here when I say direct lines of communication from other parties. And you should also always ask that your director provide you the supporting evidence that back up her claims. So lots of times there will be that sort of thing, right? So if you're um, using Dibbles or something like that as one of your assessments, the Dibbles is a regular thing, and that data is probably collected by somebody other than the director, even if the director presents it to you, that there ought to be some backup for what he's saying, right? If he's saying 80% of our kids are reading a benchmark, and look at the growth, you ought to be able to have some background that can verify for you as a board that that's true, and that your director is not just standing up and saying what will make himself look. So, good directors, and for those of you that are directors in the room, you should never be offended when your board says, that's great news, would you please verify that that's data so that we can always know that that's true, right? Okay, 
You need to have a policy whereby people can get redress of grievances. This is important because one of the things you always need to hold your director accountable for is proper application of the rules, right? One thing that you ought to have in your policy is that your director can't play favorites, right? She can't say that, well, this is my, my daughter-in-law's soccer coach, and so therefore I want to uh, you know, be nice and give that person a raise. But I deal with schools where there are real problems, where it seems like this is the favored class of teachers, and they all make five to ten thousand dollars a year more than the unfavored class of teachers, just because they have more of a history with the school director. Or this person used to be on the board, and now he's hired, and he got hired at a much higher salary than everybody else, and that's bad, right? There needs to be a real, regular procedure whereby the board can hear about legitimate complaints that are going on. How that works is the subject of another training. Um, which I'll, we'll go over hopefully sometime over the course of this series of, pre of presentations, but I just want to make sure that you guys have that. And finally, you need to have direct contact with your authorizer. That there's a reason why your state charter school board sends its communication to the chair of the board, right? Uh, that if you're meeting, you guys always ought to be getting updates from the school if they have any about if there's any communication from the authorizer. But it's also important that uh, that the board has a direct line of communication because they will hear issues about your school that you might not hear directly from your director if your director is kind of trying to squirrel, squirrel away information that might make a little bit Okay? Any questions about that? I mean, I kind of say this as though directors are in the habit of hiding information, and they're not. Um, but on the other hand, when you walk into a store, you have to check your backpack at the front. And it's not because you look like a crook, but it's because crooks don't look like crooks, right? And so they have to treat everybody the same, so you just check your backpack on the way in. In the same way that good directors look just the same as crooked directors, and so we just have standards whereby people will always verify what's going on. Okay? So let's talk about calendars and when we collect this data. The most important thing is you ought to collect, receive, and analyze data on an ongoing basis. In a couple of slides here, I'll have some calendars and things like that that I can show you that are samples that you can use to kind of to build your own things. But the timing of this is going to vary depending on what you're measuring. So if you're using SAGE scores as a measurement, then you're probably going to measure that in August. Where if you're using Dibble scores, then you'll probably measure that in October, January, March, and May, right? Those four times a year when you probably are giving benchmark and regular testing as you if uh, the financial data is one of those, then certainly you're going to review your financial audit, which probably comes to you in November, but you probably also ought to have at least three or four other times when you see progress reports to your budget goals, right? Um, if you're doing a survey of your staff and your teachers and your parents, then I usually recommend that the best time to have that happen is February, and then you would review that in March. And we'll talk about why in just a minute, okay? And when you evaluate the director, is going to be, you ought to have an ongoing calendar, and again, I'll show you a sample in a minute, where you can see we're measuring this, 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 and that the evaluation of the director happens at the sweet spot when you've got enough data where you can make a judgment about how things are going, and early enough that you're not going to put the school or the director in a bind if things need to change, right? That is, if you wait until July or August to perform that evaluation, then you're pretty much stuck with either a rotten, and your director was rotten, right? So, we've got a poor director, but we didn't really evaluate him until July or August. We're either going to be stuck with him for the rest of the year, or we're going to have to go through the turmoil of changing out the director, right, when school is getting ready to start or has already started. I think the best sweet spots for this is usually March and April to perform your director evaluations. You make the judgment about if you want to retain that person or give him a bonus or Make your judgment about his or her performance at that point. Make your decision about retention or bonus or whatever at that point, And then continue the evaluation process, which ought to be ongoing over the course of the, of the full year. Does that make sense? You'll collect more data about last year's performance after you've already decided. But really, there has to be a decision point at some, at some time. And I qualify that by saying that sometimes there are very negative circumstances that require immediate action. But in the absence of those, if you're looking at the outcome of the school based in relation to those goals, you and everybody will be better off if you have a regular and systematized way to do that that everybody knows about. Okay? So, 
for example, here's uh, one of those simple calendars. And so this is a kind of a, a board check on things where you review how it's doing in certain policies, right? What's the financial condition of the school? How are students being treated? And so it talks about how we measure these kinds of things, how often and when. And so some of these are like, these ends policies would be the goals that you set. Does this language look familiar to anybody? This is like the reinventing your board type language that John Carver has written, right? So these are the specific names of policies. Whatever you have in there, the board ought to have some sort of table like this that's known about in advance, that we are going to be reviewing how the school is performing in these areas. This is how we're going to collect that data. This is how often we're going to collect that data. And this is the timing of when we do collect that data. Having this in advance is, again, super helpful because it helps with the transparency so that everybody knows what's going on well in advance. Any questions about that? There's going to be another calendar like this, uh, another table like this that I'll show you in just a minute. Okay? So we've talked, um, I just kind of want to review where we are, right? We've talked about specific principles about how things, employees, especially directors, get evaluated. We've talked about what you need to have in place before he's evaluated, uh, goals, policies, uh, systems by which to measure. We've talked uh, quite a bit about logistics for how that works over the process, how to collect data, what kinds of sources to use for data, a little bit about how to put that calendar in frame. So now we get to the point where we have put those things in place, we've got our calendar, we've been collecting data, now it's March and April, and we're performing our annual evaluation of the director where we look at the data, and we go through the process of deciding what that data means and making a decision on how that works for the future. And an important part of that is the self-assessment of the director. Okay? So if you are the athletic committee of a football team, you would ask the coach to write about how did the season go for you. And he would probably come up with something. I lost my top quarterback, and that was harmful for us. This is going to be the most informative document that you receive over the course of the entire the director knows all of the data that you have, or should, right? Because it's collected in a public board meeting, and she probably presented you most of it. So she knows all of that data that you've got. She knows how things are going. And because you had a good system set up in place beforehand, she knows what the standards are. She knows what the results are in relation to those standards. And this is going to be her chance to write and inform the board about what was it that led to this specific outcome. And whether that outcome is great, look, we met all the goals, and I'm so proud of my staff, that whatever tone this takes in this report that comes back to you, and whether you do that in a conversation or you have the director submit a written report, it will be very informative to you about the kind of school director you have. Is this a person who uses bad instances as an excuse for bad performance? Look, we would have loved to have achieved this, but last year our top math teacher left, and so that's why our scores are down. Um, some of those things can be legitimate. It's going to be up to the board to determine whether or not that's legitimate. But if this document or this conversation is a book of excuses about why things didn't go the way they did, then you've got the wrong kind of leader at your school. Right? And that would be, this is a very good way to see what the director's response is to his or her actual performance. On the other hand, if the Data is very good. Good leaders will always share the credit, right? And so this document will be like, I just have a great team. My teachers are, are super, put this team together, and love our student body. Um, and you guys ought to be professional enough to know. I mean, you guys serve on charter school boards, and that in itself takes a quality kind of person. You ought to be able to read that, and you'll recognize the kinds of directors who submit this report to, to say, well, look, it's hands off, and I'm just limited in what I can do, versus those that take ownership, that share the credit, and that are the kind of leader that you want to have in your school. Does that make sense? Are there any questions or controversy about that? Okay, so this is after you've collected the data, then this next piece of data is the director's self-assessment for how things have gone. And then now that you guys have got all that as a board, you ought to go back and you probably will do this in a closed session and you'll review all of this data so that you can analyze it in light of your goals, analyze it in light of what you learned based on the director's self-evaluation, where the standards met. If not, there may be legitimate reasons why not, right? So I work with a school that is not going to meet its financial goals this year, right? It's uh, probably going to miss its 
maximum annual debt service coverage on his bond. And that's because they built a high school and their enrollment was just not quite where they wanted it to be, right? And the standard is pretty high. It would be easy to meet if the school was full, but it's about 92% full. And so that makes it really hard to meet this specific goal. Um, so that might be something where the board looks and says, okay, right, we understand building a new high school, not everything is within your control. Or it could be, you know, you should have adjusted your budget well in advance. Once you knew that we were going to be only at 92% enrollment, you should have started making those making those adjustments as, as you went over the course of the year, right? And these are judgments that the board gets to make, right? It's the board's job to decide whether or not a reason for, uh, I mean, an obvious correlation is a reasonable, um, I don't want to say excuse, but I can't think of a better synonym right now. But if, if that's a reasonable reason why a goal wasn't met, that's up to you guys to decide. There are lots of reasonable things. Maybe your goal was too high was just unrealistic. But as you guys operate for 5 or 10 or 14 years, you get better at setting goals and things like that. We'll talk about how to evaluate this in just a second. As you go through this appraisal, you're going to create a chart that will look something like this, right? So you'll have, here are our goals that we had known about these in advance. And I just pulled these from a recent chart that was submitted to the state. So that here are these, here are the five goals that we had, right? And so some of those are academic, some of those are very charter specific to this group. I hope you can read those okay. I know on these tables, it, you know, it's, the print still gets a little bit small on a screen like this. So for every measure, we've also got a metric for how we collect that data, right? So on this one, uh, we're gonna, we want our students to be proficient to 21st century skills. And the way that we do that is, in April of each year, we're going to make sure that 90% of our students are proficient on this specific exam. And so then this table, and it may have several lines more than this, then you've got a thing where you can check whether this not this was met. And if it was, that's great. Maybe your goal ought to be higher next year. If it wasn't, are there legitimate reasons why it wasn't? Okay? And again, those are judgments that you guys have to make as well. Uh, and that your, your director will help you know what the goals are. After you do all of that, right? You've talked to the director, you've got the self-assessment, you've met as a board, you've reviewed all the data, and now you're going to have the conversation with your director about how things need to go going forward. And you meet with the director, you discuss the school's performance and all of this, and you again, you'll learn quite a bit from this discussion. Look, as a board, we've talked about this. Here are our concerns, or maybe you don't have concerns, but you're just going, great, here's your $10,000 bonus. However this conversation goes again, You'll learn a lot from this discussion, right? If your board, if your director is willing to take ownership for performance and to be uh, coachable and refocus on what the board thinks is most important or is contributing um, and is willing to be held accountable, that's great. I've worked with things where boards over this process have just learned. It's great. We don't expect perfection in our director, but we can tell from this conversation this is not going to be the person that will lead us to where we want to go, and so we need to make a change. Right? And that leads you to the decision that you need to make. That every year, essentially, you're going to be making decisions about this kind of stuff. But every year, it's not do we fire, not fire director, things like that. But ultimately, if you have kind of the two ends of the scale, you either have a director that you keep on and maybe give a bonus because he's awesome, or a director that you start coaching with the idea that he either improves or you replace on the way out. Right? It's not a good idea to keep a mediocre director. If you do, you'll always have a mediocre school. If you want your school to be excellent, you need to be able to collect this data and not be satisfied with mediocrity in your school's performance. Um, one of the universal things that you'll find about charter schools is that there are almost no universal things that lead to excellent performance in the way of things that are outside of the director's control, right? People who have lots of economically disadvantaged students, schools that have very high economic, very high poverty, very high English language learners, often get very strong academic results. The makeup of the school is not in the control of the director, but how he handles that makeup of the school is in control of the director. So make sure that you are holding your director accountable for the results that you see in the school. And part of that also means that you need to give your director complete autonomy in how they run the school within the 
because if you as a board are putting restrictions on your director about whom and when he can make hiring or firing decisions, then what you've done is accepted that accountability on yourself instead of giving that accountability to the director, right? From that standpoint, you should also not be satisfied with a mediocre board because you'll always have a mediocre school. Please go, go through this process with the idea that this evaluative process is a tool to make our school excellent. And that that process is going to be one of identifying the leader that will make our school excellent. And this data will either show you that you do have that leader or you don't. And if you don't, then it will give you ways to coach that leader into being that kind of a person or let you know that you need to get that kind of a person. Does that make sense? I sometimes worry when I give presentations like this that I'm a, that I'm a fan of firing directors, and I'm not. I think it's usually the case that professional people at this level, with a good system in place like this, where they are held accountable for results, will usually rise to the occasion. But if they won't, this process will let you know. And without this kind of process, if what you have is a big list of to-dos, that you need to have good communication skills with your parents, and do good at fundraising, all that, then your director will always be able to come through and say, look, I, I checked out all the, the, the boxes and fours or fives, because I do this kind of stuff all the time. But as a board, you need to be focused on the performance of your school as measured by student outcome, parent satisfaction, largely financial performance, and consistently with state law and policy. After you go through that process, then you ought to evaluate your evaluation procedure, right? You guys are going to develop this at least in somewhat on your own, hopefully using the principles that we've talked about here. But you ought to know, maybe your goals were set too high, or you need to involve some other measurement to be able to determine what we've got. So after you go through this process one time, or uh, after you tweak it, actually after every time, you should talk about what worked well, and involve the director. I mean, assuming that you have retained your director over the course of the for the next year, then involve her in that process and talk about what was empowering to you and what do we need to change up, okay? Uh, how did the survey work? Make sure, again, good governance costs less than poor governance. So, board, you should evaluate yourself um, about how this worked out and take feedback from others on how your performance is so that you can go, because you want an excellent board, excellent director will always lead to an excellent school, okay? So, here we are, we've got about the perfect amount of time left for if there are any questions. I just want to encourage you as you go through here, no matter where you are in this process, you should start now, right? In fact, it's January. It's February. This is the perfect time to start putting in this process, this, uh, an evaluation procedure and framework like this, so that over the course of the next several months and into the next school year, you can have it in place and start measuring your school's performance against specific goals that are known in advance that you, for which you can collect reliable data over the course of a year, right? Um, and there's a little booklet that I provided you, and it's on your table there. And this is published by, I don't know, it says on the back, it's like some national nonprofit foundation. And this is like a nonprofit that exists to help other nonprofits. So this contains a lot of the same data because we're using a lot of the same principles, but it's not specific to charter schools, but it does in there, if you'll read it, and it's a pretty short read, there's a section in there that talks about three different methods for how to go, and what I've talked to you about kind of picks and chooses the best ones that I've found for what worked the best in charter schools, but read those and decide what you want your approach to be, what are your board's priorities that you want to measure, what's going to be the best way to measure those, and get started. And it's better to get started with something imperfect and refine it as you go than it is to sit back and wait and say, well, we really can't get going until we've got the perfect system in place, right? Um, if you just sit on your butt and do nothing, then that will lead to mediocrity or worse. So don't be afraid to make mistakes as you go through this process. Mistakes are a wonderful thing to have happen because it's how we learn how to do things better, right? Um, so please get going, get started. I want to pause here to say that the association, through this grant, has a lot of resources available to you as a school. Um, so this training session is one of those resources. But in addition to that, we've got consultants and certified trainers that are available to you 
And if you're interested in it, you just contact the association. Say, look, we went to this training, and we'd like to get somebody who can come up and help us to develop the system that we can put in place here. Help us identify what our goals should be and when we should manage them, and help us evaluate and put this thing in place. And they also have funding that will help you pay for that, right? So this help, if you want it, is available free to you. Just contact the association, tell them what your needs are, and they will arrange to have that happen. Okay? So they also have a lot of things in place. Calendars, procedures, um, lots of people, you know, people who are already on boards that have this sort of a system in place who are now uh, on kind of retainer with the association and come up and help you out. Uh, so take advantage of other schools that do this well. Um, and there's materials, you know, that we've distributed today, that little booklet. I read it and liked it. I think you guys will probably find it to be pretty useful and help me to kind of refine how this presentation went. Um, and if you want more of that kind of stuff, it's available through the certified trainers. That booklet, this presentation, a video recording of this presentation will be posted online, as well as the future trainings and things like that. For you. This is an exciting thing. I think it's about time that the, that the state has ponied up a little bit to be able to say, we want our charter schools to do better. We're going to help them be better by providing them with some funds to help them, right? Good governance costs less than bad governance. So we're going to start rolling out some things that will help improve the quality of our school governance, okay? So that's the end. I'd like you to please fill out your uh, evaluation. Joy Lynn, is it still true that on this evaluation, one is good and five is bad? I fixed the evaluation. Oh, so five is good? Um, Just make sure, last time we did it, like one was good and five was bad, which is different than how it usually goes, right? No, so. we, we've spelled it out very confident. So if you've got one that has one to five on it, then if you'll holler at me, I'll get you a different, a different okay. one. So anyway, please help us, please help us improve by helping evaluate our performance. We want this to be very valuable to you. And please also fill out the other thing. We've been in conversations as these things have been going on. What, what do Utah's charter school boards think they need the most help with? That's what we want to provide. So please also fill out that other form that talks about where you think you need some help. And uh, let's help make this mentoring program something that can really benefit your school. And so with that, I will uh, thank you for your time and answer any questions. Yes, sir. So um, at least at the university, um, not everybody goes through a complete assessment and evaluation every year, right? So there's there's annual In public entities that usually don't. Yeah, so there's annual evaluations of almost everybody, but usually sort of limited ones. And then especially for directors and things like that, it's sort of every three years or five years you'll have like a big one where you're collecting all this data. I mean there's a lot of data. I mean mm -hmm. possible data you could bring in is quite a lot to to do you suggest doing the full thing every year, or look, we're going to sort of, as an annual evaluation, look at SAGE scores and a few other sort of targeted things, and then every third year we're going to do a full-on parent survey and a teacher survey and collect sort of uh, maybe a focus group, all these other possibilities, uh, which seems like an awful lot to do every year. Sure. So let me answer that in two ways. One of those is I would recommend that when you're, until your school and your director get established, I would probably do it more often rather than less often, right? You don't want to give a, a, a rookie a three-year blank check, right? So uh, while you're new, I mean, so maybe you're Thomas Edison, you've been around 14 years, your director's been with you for 14 years, you've had a good system in place, you probably don't need to do the full Monty every year. On the other hand, I'll say, what I presented isn't quite the full Monty, right? I've suggested that you pick three to five goals that, that are the most important to your school every year. Because, again, if you have too many, then your focus is spread too thin, right? So uh, I think that it is a good idea for the board to set, um, to have a range of three to five goals that get the main part of your focus every year. And those don't need to change every year, right? Like, one of those goals might be, over the course of the next five years, we want to build from point A to point B, and so therefore we want to see, at the end of each year, what we're going to do is just measure the growth in relation to that, right? So that would be fine. And as your school gets a little bit, you guys have been around for five years, right? So if your director's been with you for that long and you feel like you have a pretty good sense that 
okay, we picked this guy, and we pitched our wagon to him, and it's going well. Well then, I think that kind of lightening up on this is sort of okay, as long as you're not lightening up on the accountability, right? Because what's get, what gets measured is what will get the focus. And uh, if you're not measuring anything, then the director will choose the focus instead of the board. Uh, and your, your school ought to remain a board-focused school that, uh, where the director's job is to achieve the board's goals within the board's budget by following all the board's goals. Right? Okay. Does that make Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes? I guess I'm trying to, I don't even know that I know what my question is. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking on a functional level, would you say that most, it's most effective to have a committee that kind of spearheads data collection, you know, in preparation for bringing this to a full board in a closed yes. session? I mean, is that kind of the... For logistical reasons, I say yes, okay. right? But a, a, it usually will be a committee of board members mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. Right, of course, sure. Yeah. Open meetings is one of those, and also, you know, the bigger the committee, then the more likely you're to create a cabinet. Any other questions? Great. How many of you were offended that I spent so much time talking about? So my brother and his wife teach at Utah State. So just like highlighting all my Logan connections over here. So I went to dinner with him. You know, I went to dinner with him before. He's like, you better be careful talking to these people. <laughs> well, but it gave us an opportunity for Schadenfreude. Because it was bad news about BYU. That's right. It's not a, That's exactly what I said, although I didn't say Schadenfreude. It doesn't matter, right? They won. <laughs> Yes, sir. But anyway, he is the one who let me know the difference between true blue and pro blue, yeah. which I agree with. <laughs> okay? Good. Well, if there are no other questions, then I will say that I'll be happy to hang out here for a little while. So if you want to come and talk to me maybe about something that's more specific to your school, uh, but you don't want to ask in front of the whole group, I'll be here. And otherwise, thank you so much for coming. And I hope that you will spread the word about these things. If you found value in this, there will probably be another one taught up in this neck of the woods, at right. least Ogden and North. Um, in the next couple of months on some different topic that you're going to help us choose by filling out these forms and that we hope that you've found value in it and will continue to find value in it and, and take advantage of it because we're likely to continue getting the help if we get good participation and good results. So thanks a lot. Thank you.